Thank you. I think that when something cannot be proven and it seemed bizarre or strange, the Scientology response would be, well, it's spiritual. Mm. Sacred know? science. Yeah, yeah. And, and but, but I think when I reset my entire way of thinking was when I realized that you cannot swallow something because so-and-so said. I remember one person talking to me and saying, Karen, do you believe in VTs? Do you believe in Ron's attached spirits? Do you believe in VTs? And I said to him, why do you want my opinion? on it have you not formed your own and he said well if you told me it was true i would then believe in it yeah. and i said no no you're back to guru thinking yeah. <laughs> if karen said there are bts there are bts mm. but, but i want to i want to go back on truth and lies john because it's yeah. such a fundamental i think it's everybody in the world in their heart has some the way you think is the way you make decisions and the way you make decisions affect your life because i believed because i believed and and you know there was no excuse for me because i had listened to all the class eight tapes at saint hill yeah. before i signed my billionaire contract so I heard all the sci-fi fantasies and everything. Mm. But I had already swallowed it that, you know, the saying in the Sea Org is, what does Ron say? If you're querying something at all, what don't would Ron do? What would Ron do? What would Ron do? What would Ron do? And you're so run away and take the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that most people have an innate feeling of justice versus injustice that's like, that's why juries are so diligent in making their pronouncement on guilty verdict. these are fundamental basics within us all and the truth and lies is just so deeply embedded but People have because they can't because they can't think straight. They will swallow the lie. Do you have a very simple educational coaching in two three sentences that can help people who are just swallowing well, what they get as truth? I, I just I, I just so happen to. Um, <laughs> opened a file here that is something I've been quoting to people since before I was in Scientology. Oh. This is the text from which Hubbard um, somehow come, came to the statement, what's true for you is true. Oh. Uh, but this is, as ever with Hubbard, this is not at all what was said. This is a statement made by the Buddha, so somewhere around 500 BC, and it's called the Kalama Sutta or Sutra, and it was delivered to the Kalamas, who are a, a, a tribe of people. And it says, believe nothing on the faith of traditions, even though they have been held in honor for many generations in many places. Do not believe a thing because many people speak it. Do not believe on the faith of the sages of the past. Do not believe what you yourself have imagined, persuading yourself that some God inspires you. Believe nothing on the sole authority of your masters or priests. After examination, believe what you yourself have tested and found to be rational and conform your conduct thereto. But there's no testing. Well, <laughs> what you found. There's no testing rational. in the cult of Scientology. No. And We're in your challenging Hubbard. Whoa. Uh, it's. <laughs> 
And, and I mean, as you said, when we last spoke, that, that when people, you know, when we say, look, there are no operating Thetans, there are, there's nobody with supernatural powers. There are no clears by Hubbard's definition of a clear. People still catch colds. They don't have perfect memory. They don't have perfect emotional equanimity. There are no releases. There's nobody who can communicate freely to anyone on any subject, certainly in Scientology, where you're forbidden to talk to suppressives and you can't talk about your case and you can't have can't talk about the technology that's verbal text so it everything is, is conflict and contradiction and whenever you or i say that to a believer they say didn't you have wins yeah <laughs> like, every day of my life i have realizations of one kind or another usually yeah. to the effect that i'm not as smart as i thought i was you know that's a cognition that i have on a daily basis but yeah. the the idea that you know that which is good in your life comes from the guru, the cult, the teacher, yeah. the leader. Yeah. And the idea that, that what doesn't work is because you didn't apply the technology correctly. Well, you know, which technology? The technology of harassment, because yeah. that's a very developed technology in Scientology. The, I was talking earlier today with Mike Rinder and we're talking about the public relations technology and just saying, look at Hubbard on camera. You know, look at the, you know, him, he was saying when James Phelan wrote the first real investigative piece in, I think, 1963, Hubbard walked around boasting that the Saturday Evening Post was going to do this great piece about him. That's what he thought from, from his brilliant insight into another human being. And Phelan was the first person to point out loudly that Ron Hubbard was a charlatan who was lying about his biography because mm -hmm. he'd gone and researched it. So Hubbard couldn't read people and... He was rubbish at public relations. He was rubbish at marketing. He was rubbish at singing. That's for sure. Thank you for listening. He wasted two years of Chick Corea's life on that stupid album. You know, a great musician who could have been doing something useful instead. He was a rubbish photographer. He was a lousy poet. He was a dreadful writer. And he's kind of going, mm, OK. And this is the man who's saying, just be like me. You know. But look at what, look at, look at, in his wake, because of this one thing, belief of the truth, mm -hmm. look at the organizations that still exist and look at the dedicated 5,000. Talking about CEO slaves, let me give you a little, did you ever meet a girl called Jeannie, Jeannie Franks, Jeannie Bogvard? Jeannie Sonnenfield. No. Did you ever meet her? No. She was sort of a household name in Scientology in the 70s. Mm. She married Bill Franks. He was later appointed as Executive Director International. You may, you probably know Bill Franks. Yes, I've been in touch with Bill every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Bill has passed. Yeah. Jeannie was married to him at one time. And she and Bill were sent to Washington, D.C. to boom them or which it kind of did. Anyway, Jeannie and I were totally best friends. Every girl should have one close girlfriend and Jeannie was it. We were on the Apollo together. We took, we did many, what we call libs a day off together. We crossed the United States together in a car when we were both in the RPF. We were transferred from Clearwater, prison camp to Los Angeles prison camp. Rehabilitation. Look, look at the word, we're talking about lies. Rehabilitation. Hard manual labor and five hours mandatory indoctrination. Okay. Jeannie was in through thick and thin. At one point, Jeannie was commanding officer of AOSH UK mm. before her brother, John Danilovich, was made commanding officer. Jeannie was commanding officer. She absolutely was devastated at the death of her third husband, Jens Bofer, who died of cancer. And she got into some, uh, to convolute, I won't get into the whole story. Anyway, this, this is it. She was in 50 years. And the last 20 years, she was the executive director of Cincinnati Org, putting Cincinnati on the map. 
she was on stage, she got presentations, uh, best ideologue, she's in the glossy magazines. I'm gonna, <laughs> let me send some nice pictures to Skype, to Spike, <laughs> to I Skype. I did. Put up. <laughs> right. So, so she did 50 years, she did maybe 55 years. And John, brace for the next statement. She has just been declared a suppressive person. This is the end of the road of 50, 50 plus years in this. They didn't know she was suppressive mm. as she worked 60, 80 hour weeks. All, doesn't Scientology say they know how to shut, they know how, don't they say you how to detect an SP? Don't they say you the PTS SP course, which they force you to do over and over again? People have done it three times. So they didn't know Jeannie was a suppressive person. For the 50 years, she slaved. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I just want to pump in case somebody views that Jeannie was such a household name. I just need her to know there is an aftermath foundation and they will give her a soft landing and they will let her land on her feet. She's probably tending to her husband, David Sonnenfield, the Australian, who has fourth degree stage cancer, fourth, fourth stage cancer, who's dying of fourth stage cancer. But we're talking about lies and truth. Jeannie swallowed it all. She swallowed it all for 50 years. And John? What was the end of the what is the end of the road of someone who has slaved? I slaved 20 years. Yeah. So I can read <laughs> give me some comments on the genie son and fell story, please. Just in the little anecdote I just told you, looking at truth, lies, freedom, trapped. Give me a couple of wise John Atak responses why is john atac responses coming up um i i can only agree with you that the um suppressive person and potential trouble source detection course evidently is not tremendously effective <laughs> i remember when um our friend david mayo was declared in 1982 my my mum was involved in scientology she came in to, to see what if what I was doing was safe and got herself caught up in it. And I remember her commenting me at the time, how could he be in Scientology for 25 years and Ron Hubbard didn't notice this? <laughs> you know, if Ron Hubbard is that now, and it, it's true when, um, you know, I left be, because uh, I don't normally, I've never named him publicly, but, but it, it's known now that I'm a close friend of Ira Chaleth. So I might as well, Ira, Ira Chaleff. Oh, Ira, yeah. And the, the reason I left Scientology was because I was summoned in, I can't remember his name offhand, but he was somebody who'd known Ira and worked with him for, I think he said 15 years. And I was summoned in um, to St. Hill and, and told in, in, down in the south of England and East Grinstead, told I got to go and it was really important, um, Peter Shantz. Oh, yeah. yeah. I sat down with Peter, who I didn't really know, and he said, um, there's a rumour that Ira is going to be declared suppressive. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, that's not a good idea, is it? And Ira had actually been on leave of absence working for me at an artist agency at the time, and he was helping out. And um, so Peter was very, you know, this is a terrible thing and, and we will have to fight it. I remember him saying that, we'll have to fight it. A week later, he summons me back in and, uh, you know, you've got to come in and can't say it over the phone and all of this nonsense. And he said, Ira has been declared. Mm. And I said, how do you know? And he said, there's a list of, I think it was 611 people or something. And he's on the list. I said, where's the suppressive person declare? He said, there isn't one. Mm. He said, where's the bill of particulars? There isn't mm. one. 
where's the where are the findings and recommendations of the committee of evidence there isn't one well why are you sure that he's a oppressive person you know last week you say i'm going to fight it he said well they can be so devious these people and that was it that's all i got that, that he'd known and loved this wonderful man 15 years or whatever and now he was willing to throw him overboard because his name was on a list you know okay. speaking of checking the evidence and mm -hmm. um, what's true for you is true this so that it is it is a terrible problem that that somebody commits decades of their life I, I gave nine years but i wasn't in the sea org i wasn't humiliated and abused i had a pretty good time of it really um they just you know, they took my money and messed my head up so it was no no great loss um it was very instructive i'd rather it had happened a little faster you know if i'd been a, a wiser person i could probably have made the same gains in about three weeks it wouldn't have taken the whole nine years to realize but there is something tremendous in the sense of release for anybody for however long they've been involved that some people go i've wasted my life and i've met a lot of people who've told me that i i could have done so much else and you say to them look and i'm not a buddhist i know i'm coming sounding like one at the moment but because this is the second reference the buddha grew up in a palace where he had everything and he was protected from old age disease and death he mm -hmm. never saw any of those things and he could have lived his whole life that way and had he lived his whole life that way, the transformation that he caused in the world, and as I say, I'm not a Buddhist, I don't think it's a good idea being celibate, and I don't think it's a good idea being a monk or any of that stuff. So there, I've said it. Um, I was a Buddhist as a teenager. Um, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, the wisdom that he brought into the world, into a relatively barbarous society, has sustained. And part of that wisdom is, is the idea of compassion. So had he had a lovely life, he wouldn't have been able to, to do what he did. And I think for any of us that, I mean, you, you've managed in the last few years to have a tremendous impact on the world, a positive impact that nobody in Scientology could have. And that's as a consequence, I mean, Joseph Campbell will talk about going into the, you know, going and getting the wound so that you can come back and, and help people. And I think that's true. For me, the wound came in opposing Scientology. You know, they spent 16 years harassing me and grinding me into the dirt. But it's nonetheless, that's the vital experience that, that I have, that I, I, without that, I have very little to say and very little usefulness. So even if you'd spent 50 years involved in this, you have actually, without knowing it, accumulated wisdom. And the wisdom mm -hmm. is probably the opposite of what you thought it was, because it is about going, oh, yeah, I am. I can be my own guru. How can I help other people to think for themselves, which is the same thing? How can I help people to question their certainties? I want to say something else about um, the stupidity element. I, I had a, a friend who has a PhD in physics who spent 30 years involved in a Hindu group, which abused him horribly. And he came up to me and he's like, how could I have been so stupid? He's got a PhD, you know, how could I have been so stupid? It's sort of, it's got nothing to do with intelligence. If you look over history, um, look at somebody like Isaac Newton, who is probably held to be the most influential scientist of all time. He was a nutcase. He spent more time doing alchemy than he did doing science. He spent more time going through the Bible, trying to find a code that would show him the proportions of Solomon's temple, which he believed to be the proportions of the universe. So he also gave us, you know, laws of thermodynamics and optics and all sorts of wonderful things as a young man. But it could be that all the mercury he took as an alchemist got to his head. Galileo, who is held up as the, you know, that's science versus religion. He had two children. He put them both into a convent. So that's how much against religion Galileo was he also and this is true of Newton as well they both invented a huge amount of their work so that whenever the Principia was revised there are two revisions during Newton's life he improved the results tables at the back he lied about mm -hmm. half of Galileo's experiments are fraudulent if you actually do take a, a 
you know, a bag of lead that weighs the same as a bag of feathers and you drop it from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, mm. the lead will reach the ground first because it's not simply weight, there's also air resistance. Mm. You know, how large is the object? And you know, there are various things going on here. So that was a lie. And it's a lie that science is based upon. I bring that up to say, these people were not stupid. They were very, very clever people, mm. but they were fallible. And they yeah. were, they, you know, they wanted to be acknowledged for what they were doing. Um, yeah. Newton, in fact, would have been executed had his religious belief become known. He was a Unitarian. He didn't mm. believe that Jesus was divine. Uh, and that was an executable offence in the seven, late 17th century in this country. Uh, we've got a little bit further since then, not far enough, but we're a little more civilised than we used to be then. But it, so some very, very clever people get caught up in things. And it's then what what have we learned and what can we give? And I, you know, I when I some years ago, 2015, helped to kickstart the Open Minds Foundation, I reached out to ex-cult members, you know, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Scientologists, what have you, believing that they would flood because of their wisdom to help me to teach to the world these simple principles, to, you know, to the next generation to prevent recruitment. But I found out that people are actually just obsessed with Scientology and going round and round and talking about it forever. Yeah. It, so there's there's an end to that. There's a point you know, which came for me oh, in about 1991. I decided that Scientology is a microcosm. It's just one of the little elements of authoritarianism, of controlling people, of, of having people who believe they ought to be God on Earth or Ron Hubbard you know, or Sun Myung Moon or what have you, and that other people ought to do what they want, Mao Zedong, Hitler, Stalin, been lots of them, and people who believe that they need somebody else to tell them what to do. Yeah. Predators yeah. and prey. Yeah. And for me, the, the lesson and the, the lesson that we can teach to the world because of our experience is you don't have to be a predator and you don't have to be prey. Yeah. You know, you can actually try and create a a proper democracy where people are not you know, caught up in emotional passion yes. and fervor. I've got somebody at the moment who I, I did a, a great talk with Jamie DeWolf the other week. That guy is so much fun. I love him. Who, of course, is Ron Hubbard's great grandson. Yes. And um, he's just yes. fantastic. He's just great. But somebody said, oh, you don't seem to like Donald Trump. It, it, and it's like, well, no, not particularly. What's to like? And I've suddenly got this barrage of things coming on about you know how great Donald Trump is, and, and I'm kind of going, I, I just don't feel that passion about anybody. You know, I'd much rather look at it and say, well, I think tariffs on China was quite a good idea. I think the way he dealt with Kim was a little bit strange. I'd rather look at it point by point, and I'm not going to go, well, you know, crooked Hillary or Joe Biden this, or I'm not very keen on any of the presidents or any of the prime ministers of, or any of the kings of any of the places in the world ever. I'm very happy to say, you know, I think the New Deal was a good idea, but I think FDR was an alcoholic and mm. that's not really a good idea. And, you know, there are, as Benjamin Franklin said, you draw a line down the middle of, of the paper and you say pro, con. And, and when you get to the point where you've only got pros or only got cons, You've been conned, yeah. <laughs> basically, because there is no human being. Yeah. Indoctrination is it's only pro, and yeah. it's flawless, and it never makes a mistake. Hmm. And the only reason the tech didn't work is you are connected to a suppressive person. Hmm. You are PTSD. You, 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 you. Yeah. Finger is pointed. So. That was that was very good, John. That was that was very very good. It's so fatal to glom on to some celebrity or a guru or whatever as the <laughs> and create a filter that you will only see through their eyes and only take their truth. That was. That was what cost me 40 years of life. But you know the old saying, and 
to summarize what you just covered. That which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. Right? You know, I'd just, like to, just like to point out the man who said that spent the last 15 years of his life in a mental hospital because he had oh, wow. syphilis, which definitely didn't improve his health. It was oh. Nietzsche who said it. It was Nietzsche. Oh, uh, and beating children isn't good for them. And but it's certainly true that um that which you survive and yes. integrate and digest yes. very definitely. Yes. And yes. just a thing about imitation as well, the idea of you know, the, the guru and doing what the guru says. Um, mm -hmm. When Ray Charles was a young man, the great brother Ray, one of the most remarkable musicians in all of history, I think, he, if you listen to his first records, you kind of go, that's Nat King Cole. Yeah. He was <laughs> trying, to, and his manager eventually came to him and said, look, you can be a Nat King Cole impersonator all your life. I and mean, it's uncanny, the thought that somebody who'd got that much soul going on would be singing these quiet sort of yeah. you know and i love nat king cole too absolutely wonderful and brother ray broke out and he became brother ray and what's significant in this story is that to be the fullest you you have to become unique it's yeah. no good being you know a freddie mercury impersonator yeah. you've got to develop yourself yeah. And the unique qualities that you have as a human being, and that's true not just for artists and musicians, that's true for anyone. Yeah. That yeah. Everybody has within them their own talent, their own genius, and it's yes. refining that and encouraging that and bringing it forth rather than cloning yourself onto yes. Ron Hubbard. Yes. He wants to Absolutely. be it. Absolutely. Right on. Yeah. Right on. Right on the nose. I think we hit a good peak there, John. Yes, yes. So we we better declare we've had a win. See if I'm writing, write a success story, and pay for our next course. Don't you think? <laughs> oh, John, I I don't feel bitter at all about those forty years. I, if there's one thing I got out of this life, which will last me through eternity, is you don't fall for a guru, no matter what. <laughs> that yeah. was a valuable lesson for yeah become yourself and and you've done it and and you're a great person you know I, I met you first few years ago and i was bowled over you know i knew about you but when i met you i sort of went what an incredibly sweet human being you know and that that was how i came away from our meeting and that's what our conversations have also provided so you became you you know no matter whatever else was going on you became you um I, I was asked to ask you a question, which I think is probably irrelevant, but somebody pointed out to me a week ago that, that you're still listed as a member of an organization, <clears throat> which I'm told I'm not meant to laugh at the name of. It's called APIS, um, which I think is a very oh, association. No, that got question. deleted, that got deleted. That, that must be some from the Wayback Machine. Mm. I was completely deleted off. Is that? An Australian Michael Moore site? Absolutely not. Yeah. Have him send you a present time link. Well, um, no, I mean, I just wanted to to confirm to the population of the world that, that you are no longer a Scientologist. Oh, I am not a Scientologist. I, <laughs> in fact, in the most ludicrous way, Scientology has declared that you cannot call yourself a Scientologist. This is a precious word of theirs, but be that as it may, I am not a Scientologist. No, I'd like to indicate that we are not Scientologists. We are not Scientologists. <laughs> okay, it's been, it's been great having this conversation as ever, and um, we will switch- Hope to see it. you in a month, John. Yes, we'll see you in a month's time. And I'll see um, you in a month's time. Thank great. you. Thank you. And, uh, and I would like to just tell the audience, please subscribe, stay with us. If you can even make just a one-time donation, click any small donation helps John. It's a long journey. There's a lot of research, a lot of work and background stuff to maintain a channel like this. So. If you can help, even on a one-time basis, 
or a patron basis, please do it. Great. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. If you've come this far, <laughs> you're one of us. <laughs> you're not as I for you with a rope to stay with us. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye, John. Cheer, bye.